past the much-anticipated summit meeting between U.S. President Joe Biden and China's President Xi Jinping concluded in San Francisco this afternoon, the prospect that the question of Tibet came up at all appeared slim to none. While Xi told Biden that planet Earth is big enough for the two countries, he also said it is unrealistic for either to expect to remodel the other. Notwithstanding that, the international campaign for Tibet, a Washington-based Tibetan advocacy group's recently incumbent president, Teng Cho Gyatso, points out that the Tibetan Policy Act mandates that the president and the Secretary of State encourage the Chinese leadership both privately and publicly to enter into a dialogue with the Dalai Lama or his representatives, leading to a negotiated agreement on Tibet. Given the broad sweep of tension points between Washington and Beijing, which have pushed bilateral relations to its lowest depth in recent decades, it is not clear whether President Biden would have raised the Tibetan question during this meeting. My Chai report spoke to Tenjo Gyatso to understand what in the judgment of the campaign needs to be done to encourage a direct engagement between the Dalai Lama and Beijing to find a negotiated settlement of more than six decades old standoff replete with repression and cultural erasure of the Tibetan people. Tenjo Gatso. You, you made a statement uh, uh, that the Tibetan Policy Act mandates uh, the, that the president and secretary of state uh, encourage the China's leadership to engage directly with the Dalai Lama and look for a negotiated settlement, which is a, a, a very enlightened position to take. But the problem is, why do you think China would consider it has any incentive at all to engage the Dalai Lama anymore? I say it with a great deal of uh, anguish, but that's the reality. I think China has to realize, uh, in my humble opinion, that His Holiness is the solution for a peaceful future in the region. And until and unless that happens, um, what they're doing is just increasing repression uh, of the Tibetan people and just closing the borders and trying to control at every level. And that kind of control and assimilation will only lead to people not being happy and being um, looking uh, and yearning for more than there is. Um, so that is not the solution to go. And I think United States, in the position that they have, um, has uh, uh, President Biden, especially, has a um, uh, a um, special opportunity this time to raise things directly with President Xi. And President Biden, um, before in, um, in his campaign, um, had also um, made a statement on Tibet that he would raise Tibet um, directly with um, his Chinese counterparts and that he would stand up for Tibet. So I think it's an opportunity and this is a moment because in terms of um, the repression um, under President Xi Jinping, it's gone from worse to worse inside Tibet. And um, for Tibetans um, right now, I think it's important to get a message that um, their um, nonviolent, peaceful um, struggle is something that the world pays attention to. So that's why we, as International Campaign for Tibet, we're urging um, President Biden um, to raise Tibet um, publicly. As cynical and as inhumane it sounds, for quite some time the Chinese strategy has been essentially to outlive the Dalai Lama. In fact, the Dalai Lama himself has conceded that to me a few times that they're basically waiting for me to die. Yeah. Uh, that's their, that's the broad strategy, which is a very cynical way to do it, but they have made the calculation that it works in their favor. It's essentially a state against an individual conflict. That's what they think. What is your take on something as cynical as that? 
So I think there really uh, is not a level of understanding of um, what uh, the Dalai Lama stands for, for the Tibetan people. Um, even um, you know, while we urge um, for the future of Tibet, the best scenario is um, under the leadership of this present Dalai Lama, that Tibetans can come together. Um, but even if the Chinese out uh, wait, play the waiting game and go forward, um, the future um, will be uh, a very complicated future. Um, if the Chinese resort to whereby they interfere in the um, future resolution of whatever the future Dalai Lama process will be, um, the Tibetans would not take something like that seriously, uh, easily. Um, so it will be a um, it will be unpredictable how things will move. And I can tell you, um, it it would not die away as the Chinese probably think that it will, because the relationship between um, what the Dalai Lama stands for, for the people of Tibet. It's not just the 14th Dalai Lama, but it goes back to many lifetimes. And it's a bond that is, um, that, it, that is tied deeply to the Tibetan identity and who we see ourselves to be. So it's not even a question of, you know, within the lifetime of this Dalai Lama, but it's a question deeper than that, that's attached to um, how Tibetans identify themselves to be. And um, yeah, so I think um, in this space, um, deep down the Chinese people must know that um, the Dalai Lama is a man of peace. I mean, look at how the whole world recognizes this man who has been awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. And there is China calling him a man in wolf's clothing. I mean, it just, you know, um, it seems um, kind of um, laughable in this situation that they're, that's what they're um, dealing with. Um, but at the same time, they're very arrogant and they have a master plan that they seem to be following with very strictly. You know, it is ironic that uh, on the one hand, they recognize the profound importance of the institution of the Dalai Lama as a tool that they can manipulate. But on the other, they do not want to deal with this particular Dalai Lama. They want a Dalai Lama, but not the 14th Dalai Lama. Because, and that's the reason why they've been talking about selecting one themselves. Success, they want to say in the succession, which is absurd. Yes, so um, in this, we're trying to um, uh, deal with um, how as you know, as a we're, uh, international campaign for Tibet is an American organization. We are based in Washington, D.C., and um, uh, we are an organization supported by Americans who love Tibet, who love His Holiness, and who care for this issue. So our goal is to try and help shape U.S. policy uh, to support the Tibetan issue. And in this regard, we have a bill uh, right now uh, in Congress, both in the Senate and um, in the House, called Promoting a Resolution to the Tibet-China Conflict Act. And this is something that looks at uh, how to uh, um, strengthen the Tibetan position, that it is dialogue, um, that the Tibetan position is unresolved, and that there needs to be dialogue between the Chinese leadership and the Tibetan uh, Tibetans to come to a resolution. And this bill also um, looks at um, the history because China leaves the basis for negotiations that um, Tibet has been part of China since antiquity. So this bill looks at Tibet as a people that's separate um, from China and that uh, historically Tibetans have been a separate uh, identity. So this um, builds, looks at that and uh, puts the onus on China to that um, it is um, on their uh, hands to come to a negotiating table. 
Do you think uh, that the U.S. generally and President Biden particularly have enough moral capital left to lean on Xi over Tibet and its future? And I ask, in the specific context of the Israel-Hamas war, where the U.S. has practically overlooked the terrible deaths of thousands of Gazan children and women because of Israeli bombings, uh, she may turn around and say, you don't have a problem with that, but you have a problem with this. And I, I personally think that there is a, a thinning moral capital that uh, Washington is suffering from at this stage. We can, I mean, we look at the history of what China has done in Tibet. And you look at the whole history, uh, uh, the broader picture. And if you can't, uh, um, you know, um, uh, kind of way, uh, individual uh, instances, but on the overall, who has standing in the um, world to bring um, China, uh, to talk to China? I mean, China, look at what China is doing uh, inside Tibet for the last 60 plus years. That has to be uh, raised, I think. And in the United States, wherever um, we Tibetans look to the United States as um, somebody, uh, as a country that stands up for its democratic values and in dealing with um, uh, China, um, you have to keep those um, values in place, I think, um, uh, to have a values-based dialogue also. Um, so I hope that President uh, Biden, in this case, will, um, will keep that uh, uh, in, uh, in mind as he comes to speak with uh, President Xi. There is a perception of, among certain quarters that human rights as a moral leverage is almost an outdated idea, especially with leaders like Xi or Russia's President Vladimir Putin, who do not really care for that at all. So using human rights as a leverage has been rather ineffectual in both these cases. With that being the case, what kind of new strategy do you think Tibetans generally and the Dalai Lama particularly can aim for within the Buddhist philosophy that you pursue? Well, I think His Holiness's message has always been that Tibet has something to offer to the world and that Tibetan culture is part of all the, the wonderful things that, um, um, that different communities bring to the world stage and for the betterment of humanity. And in that regard, I think um, we Tibetans can stand out and uh, be a player, um, an equal partner um, for the world communities. And for Tibetan culture to thrive, you cannot have a, a we, you know, in this exile uh, situation until now, we have a base in India, the Tibetan community has a base in India, where we've been able to reestablish um, ourselves and, um, and uh, see uh, a culture thriving in exile. But for the culture to really live, it needs its space and its country, and it's linked to, you know, um, to Tibet in more ways than one. I mean, you look at the region, the monasteries, the mountains, the the um, the lakes. You know, all of these have long thousand, you know, years, thousand year history and connection to Tibet. So you can't really mix those. So I think we have to, when you speak about Tibet. We have to connect it in that way and look at it from that perspective, and not just only, um, you know, uh, um, human rights and religious freedom for Tibetans, but also to look at what Tibetans can contribute to that for a more peaceful um, world. What, according to you, is an ideal negotiated solution at this stage? His Holiness has always said um, that um, um, he looks at the world from a different um, perspective, I think, uh, because um, he talks about Europe, you know, how things were not too long ago where Europe, some countries were clashing against each other and looking to each other as enemies. 
Tibet and China um, are, are neighbors in that sense, neighboring countries. So we have to, in whatever the case be, you have to live, learn to live together. So he's looking at it from that position. And that um, the final say for a negotiation, so negotiated solution has to be within the um, realistic and within the space uh, for something that works for the Tibetans as well as the Chinese people because you are there together. So I think that has to be um, uh, the basis uh, for it. And I think it is, um, it's not an easy thing even for Tibetans to um, take uh, um, at this point because, um, but in His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, the current 14 Dalai Lama, there is a figure whom both the Tibetans and Chinese can respect and who can help find a resolution that's not just only for the Tibetans, but that will benefit the Chinese, that will benefit the world community, that will build, bring peace and security to the whole region. So I really think we have in His Holiness the Dalai Lama a man of peace and a man who really looks to uh, bringing the best for everyone involved. And I really hope that, um, and His Holiness truly believes that within his lifetime, um, that um, there will be changes that will be coming. And um, I also believe that in the work we do, and that's what energizes us, and that's what um, gives us, um, you know, impetus um, to work, even while, um, as on the on the surface of it, you can see how how bad things are in Tibet, and how stubborn and difficult you know the Chinese leadership are, and they are so arrogant and they can lie, complete lie in your face um, like that. Um, uh, but at the same time, you kind of um, look at his holiness and what he has achieved in his lifetime. This young, you know, this young boy from a small village in um, a northeastern uh, part of Tibet that was thrust into the center and given the highest position of the land and he, um, you know, um, given the best education that Tibet could offer. And then he loses his country and comes just with his, almost the clothes on his back as a refugee to India. And from there, he comes up on the world stage as, um, as a leader and respected citizen, you know, one of the most respected citizens around the globe. And this man is the one who can bring a solution. And I think the, if President uh, Biden can bring that message to President Xi Jinping, and um, that the lead, you know, I think um, that needs to happen. There was, um, I think, the only time um, that has happened prior was uh, in a press conference with um, uh, where President Clinton raised with then. Um, uh, pres was it then president was it then Xiaoping with the Chinese premier right. then, where he was face to face and he said this is a man of peace and you should talk to him and you should get to know right. him just sit down with him yeah. you know uh, it's unfortunate uh, fact that uh, the Dalai Lama's overarching compassionate worldview runs into something as crafty as the Chinese machine. For instance, I'm sure you're aware, in, even in their official diplomatic documents, they have started using the term uh, Zizang, uh, I, I, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, for Tibet. Uh, with that kind of approach, how do you think a compassionate worldview can compel a leadership like that to change? Because they are bent upon erasing uh, Tibetan culture. Yes, but things have changed in the world. I mean, you're right in one, that's a very important uh, point that we are looking at uh, also is uh, how China is signifying and changing everything that is Tibetan from taking young children from 
um, stopping young children from learning their language and culture and taking putting them into boarding schools to changing names of places and including not using the name Tibet. But it, this is at a broader level, but even at a grassroots level, changing names of places where traditionally Tibetans have known different places by different names. So now you look at a map, you can't find those places because all the names have been changed. Um, so it's at a very sinister um, level that changes are taking uh, uh, place in Tibet. Uh, but at the same time, changes in the world politics happen like that. Who would have thought what happened, you know, the Berlin Wall going down Russia, what happened to Russia, all of those. So I think China is also... Um, even while we see a grand visit by President Xi Jinping, um, it's not all uh, nice and uh, happy back home. There are a lot of problems in China um, that are just being suppressed and covered up. And um, they're ready to uh, no, know what the future will hold, what the future next few years um, may turn out to be for China. So in that space, I think, um, uh, Tibetans, um, um, our Uyghur friends, our, you know, the other um, diaspora communities, all of us were looking um, um, at this new China also. And how the world looks at China also has changed because in previous years we were dealing with um, governments around the world looking to change China and bring a modernity to China. But now I think there's more of a realization that China is a different animal. You know, China is, it, there's a more realization of what China really stands for. So with all of these things going on, it's hard to predict um, uh, or what opportunities or what kind of situation will come up. Just last couple of things. Even while we are talking, uh, the summit uh, in San Francisco is on between President Xi and President Biden. Uh, is that is is it your realistic expectation that President Biden would actually raise Tibet during uh, uh, this particular summit? Well, as you as you um, as we discussed earlier, and you mentioned in our statement, um, U.S. policy. Um, that Congress has passed called the Tibet Support and Policy Act right. of 2020 uh, has always been that the United States will support a negotiated solution for the Tibetan people. And in meetings with their counterparts, the US President, the US uh, uh, Secretary of State and others that they should uh, raise um, uh, this issue. Uh, so it is our hope that they will raise it. And if there isn't, then we are also a grassroots organization. We work with Congress, so it's our job to make sure our leaders hear our voice that they haven't raised it and that we continue to advocate um, for Tibet and see that there is a movement in this. And, you know, there are also those who say, um, at this, with these hardliners, what is the point of raising um, for dialogue when there doesn't seem to be any scope for dialogue? But uh, for that, our response has always been the Tibetan um, position under the leadership of the Dalai Lama has always been um, for uh, substantive um, dialogue to happen for a negotiated solution for Tibet. That that is the only way that, that uh, for solution is through sitting down with the Chinese and the Tibetans. And I think in that space, if there was dialogue, even while uh, a solution may not happen overnight, there can be small steps towards more understanding, towards some resolution, towards a little bit of little steps that can move um, uh, towards at least a little, giving a little space for Tibetans to breathe and be themselves. On that note, uh, Ms. Gatra, I want to really thank you for your time. I know you were pressed for it. You've just come back from India, and Ashwin was kind enough to organize it. So my gratitude to both of you.